Grab your Bibles, please. Turn to John chapter number 5, and let's stand for the reading of God's Word. All right. We are not exegeting a text today. We're not doing that. Instead, we're looking at an issue within the church. We're picking up where we left off from last week. <clears throat> if you were not here last week, then I want to encourage you to go online and listen to our message from last Sunday. Reading in verse number 9 of chapter number 5. And at once the man was healed, took up his bed and walked. And then we have this full sentence here. Now that day was the Sabbath. Verse 10. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath and it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. And then in verse 16. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. So how do we, or how do churches, deal with the Shabbat, with the Sabbath? And I'm going to show you three perspectives, and I'm going to show you that two are just unbiblical. Plain and simple. They're wrong. They're not even up for debate. It's just an area where they are Wrong, and it's not even an area where we can agree to disagree. It's, it's not a it, it, because it has all these implications into other areas. Father in heaven, I ask that you would please be with us this morning as we study your word and as we carefully and meticulously labor through multiple passages. I pray, God, that you'd give your people ears to hear and eyes to see. Help me, Lord, to be a good teacher in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's get two things out of the way right away, just blanket statements. Number one, there is no doubt that humans need rest. So when you hear me <clears throat> dissect this issue, don't think I'm neglecting the need for regular and consistent periods of Sabbath in your life. Sabbath is grounded in Genesis chapter 2 where the Lord God worked for six days and rested on the seventh day giving us as an example but that's not grounded in the law that's in the creation number two this is really important because the longer I teach the more you're going to think I don't think Pastor Sean thinks anything about Sundays or Saturdays or even getting together as a church and that's not what we're dealing with this morning so nothing I say in this message throughout the entire message should be interpreted to suggest I don't think Sunday worship is essential or if we don't want to do Sunday, we can do Lord's Day. Use John's language out of Revelation chapter number one as an example. So the church started worshiping on the first day of the week. It's been doing that for 2,000 years and it needs to continue doing that until the Lord returns. So here's our three options. Seventh-day Sabbatarians, and these are both Baptist and Adventist and Messianic Jews, or Lord's Day Sabbatarians. These are people in the Reformed. They call themselves Reformed. I'll show you their confession of faith. These are Presbyterians who are very dogmatic about this. And then there are non-Sabbatarians, and I would put myself in this category right here non sabbatarians that doesn't mean i don't understand the importance of rest rest isn't is essential but i don't think it's mandated to us in the same way as it was to israel so let's look at this confession of faith it derives its origin from 1647 it's the westminster confession of faith it's part of the presbyterian denomination and you'll see the reformed baptist copy a lot of it paragraph 7 chapter 21 as it is the law of nature that in general a due proportion of time to be set apart for the worship of God. So in his word, by a positive moral and perpetual commandment, and that's a real problematic word right there, binding on all men in all ages, he, referring to God, hath particularly appointed one day and seven for a Sabbath to be kept holy unto him, which from the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ was the last day of the week, and from the resurrection of Christ was changed to the first day of the week, which in Scripture is called the Lord's Day, 
and it is to be continued to the end of the world as the Christian Sabbath. So when you see Christian Sabbath, that's the combination there of a Sunday Sabbath. And the Puritans were known much for enforcing this. And then we'll talk about these scriptures in a little bit. This Sabbath is then kept holy unto the Lord when men and women, after a due preparing of their hearts and ordering of their common affairs beforehand, do not only observe a holy and holy rest all the day from their works, words, and thoughts. And that's pretty incredible right there. Works, words, and thoughts about worldly employments and recreations, but also are taken up the whole time in the public exercise and private exercises of his worship and then duties of necessity and mercy. And by the way, whenever you see things like this online, train yourself to look at the footnotes. Make yourself say, all right, here's this little A right here, and here's their A right here. So what is this scripture, Exodus 28? Don't just read over something. Have your Bible open, Gene, and read the text. Why am I doing that? This is what you want to do. Do I see why they did that? Does, it, do I, does that make sense to me? Can I clearly see, oh, that sentence says this. This Bible verse says that. Does that make sense to me? If it doesn't, it's okay. You have a brain. You have cognitive function. You're called to be discerning. Jeff, you're called to be discerning. Do you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you? Yes. Can the Holy Spirit teach you and guide you in all truth? Yes. Expect the Holy Spirit to do that. It is okay to disagree with something like this. Do you know who wrote this? Men like you, like me. Now, they're called the divines, which is an incredible... Don't you ever, ever, ever call me a divine. But they're called the divines. And it's a group of men who put this confession of faith together for parliament in the year 1647 or a few years in, in that time frame as they work together for it. So this morning, we want to ask and answer the question, are they right? These Lord's Day Sabbatarians, should we all be Lord's Day Sabbatarians? Did they get it right? Now, please understand the issue is all about continuity. The Seventh-day Sabbatarians, Baptists and Advents, believe in pure continuity. Saturday to Saturday. Sabbath to Sabbath. The Lord's Day Sabbatarians have a modified continuity. Why am I calling it modified? Because they changed it from Saturday to Sunday. So there's your modification right there. It went from 7th to 1st. And then the person, I would put myself in the non sabbatarian category, and I would argue for both continuity and discontinuity. All right, how would you argue for continuity? Well, I would take you to a Hebrews chapter 4, and I would show you that Jesus is our Sabbath. That Jesus is our Sabbath. In other words, the continuity is not found, Gene, in me keeping the Sabbath, but in Christ being our Sabbath. In other words, how many of you today are resting in Christ for your salvation? You are resting in Christ for your salvation. Amen? If you're not, you're not saved. I'll just tell you that right now. Because if you're saved, Christ is your solution to being right, doing right, being righteous, etc. Okay? But then what about the discontinuity? Then if you're arguing that Christ is the continuity, what is the discontinuity? Well, the discontinuity is the old covenant versus the new covenant. The old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Sinaitic covenant, the covenant God made with Israel in Exodus chapter 19, Exodus 20, all the way to 25, 26, and you could argue the entire Torah. So how important is this issue? How practical is this? Sounds like a big theological conundrum that I don't really want to deal with on Sunday morning. Can't you help me out with something more practical? Well, if they're right, then there's a lot of things that you ought not to be doing because they're worldly employments and recreations. 
So just think about what you did last Sunday and what you're planning on doing this afternoon. And unless your time is either sleeping or wholly devoted to private worship, then you're in violation of this confession of faith. You know, why are you bringing this to my, our attention? Well, I'll tell you why. Many of you will leave this church and go to a Presbyterian church. And brothers and sisters in Christ, if you want to go to a Presbyterian church, you may go. You have that freedom in Christ. Just know that that's what you're getting yourself into. And you have to decide, do I agree with this? Some of you are going to go to a Reformed church. Just know they have a different perspective on this. And you're signing up for something you obviously have not previously been a part of. And I'll show you that in just a minute. Now, this comes to lots of different issues. For example, can I watch a movie this afternoon? No. Can I go for a walk? I'm not sure. Can I play a board game? No. Can I play a round of golf? Definitely not. Can I check my work email for a moment? No, not even 30 seconds. Can I change a light bulb? Tomorrow you can. Or tonight when you see three stars in the sky, but not until. Can I go out to dinner? No, you may not go out to dinner. And if you choose to violate any of those things, then you are sinning according to that confession of faith. But wait a minute, it's not just that. It's even more than that. Are you living by the 613 commandments in the Old Testament? Do you know them and you usually work hard at that? Do you understand the kosher laws that you're violating because you want to put yourself back under this? So is this, Pastor Sean, just a matter of opinion? You think you're right, they think they're right. No, it's not. The scripture is abundantly clear. So again, pure continuity, modified continuity, or fulfillment. And that is Christ did what I can't do on my behalf. So what does the New Testament teach concerning the continuity of the Sabbath into, and the NC right here is the New Covenant. What does it teach? Is it Christians should keep the Sabbath from Friday night to Saturday night? Is it Sunday is now the new Sabbath for Christians? Or is it that Christians are no longer under the law of six days you shall do your work and on the seventh you shall rest? I would argue for green. And that's the case I'm going to make this morning. In my opinion, most New Testament Christians have this new covenant plus the Ten Commandments hybrid theological perspective because they don't know how to negotiate out of the Ten Commandments. So what they'll say is, no, I'm under the new covenant. I'm under grace. And then you say, well, you, that means you can kill somebody? No. Well, then you're tank. oh, I guess I am. And they don't know how to navigate through that dilemma, which is, are you setting aside the Ten Commandments? Because, I mean, let, let's face it, that's a, as important as the gospel is from our perspective. How many of you old enough like me to remember the moral majority? And this idea that we're going to make America morally great by legislating laws. How, can, how many of you can remember back in Alabama where they had a giant court case over the Ten Commandments? It was huge, right? Now, let's grab a hold of this, Americans, okay? For 1,400 years, 1,400 years, Israel could not keep the Ten Commandments, and somehow we think if we just post them in every city square, that'll solve America's problems. Can we all subscribe to the idea what the solution is not the Ten Commandments, but the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's the solution. So am I poo-pooing on the Ten Commandments? No and yes. Both. Do I understand them as part of God's law? Sure I do. Am I trying to live under them today? No. No. I am thankful that the grace of God has set me free from that burden. That I don't have to think about that. I don't have to weigh that on my shoulders. And, and I saw in the 830 service these looks back of, I don't agree with you. Because these Ten Commandments have become sacred to us. Sacred. So let me just plainly tell you, this morning, this plural pronoun you, if you're born again this morning, if you're part of the born again, the born from above group, 
then you are not under any aspect of the Mosaic law, including but not limited to the fourth commandment. Let me say that one more time because I don't think we all agree with that. If you are born again this morning, if you're in the grace of God, if Christ is your Savior, if you have been spiritually born from above, you are not, and I emphasize, not under any aspect of the Mosaic law, including but not limited to the fourth commandment. None. And that's my single thesis for the entire sermon. Reformed Baptists typically talk about a Christian Sabbath and appeal to their 1689 Confession of Faith, also known as the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. The most famous person alive today is Vody Bachman, and he will argue on YouTube just passionately that you're not Reformed if you don't keep the Sabbath on Sundays. They copied their entire Confession of Faith right from the Westminster, even the commas, and then the single reference to grab a hold of is Exodus 28, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You say, what about these other references? Well, it's 1 Corinthians 16, which says we met on the first day. Acts 27, which meant that we met on the first day. And Revelation 1.10, which says that they met on the Lord's day. None of them speak to all this detailed language right here. For example, here's the language. Uh, Starts with Christ was the last day of the week, and from the resurrection of Christ was changed into the first day of the week, which is called the Lord's day. Do you see that changed right there? I want you to raise your hand if you feel like I know my New Testament fairly well. I want you to raise my, your hand if you feel like I know my New Testament fairly well. Okay? A few hands going up. How many remember the verses that you read in which the apostles changed it from Saturday to Sunday? How many of you remember the verses where that word changed is there and they clearly communicated a change from... Anybody remember that? You remember James talks? No, no, not Paul. Anybody remember Paul? Jesus, Jesus. Surely Jesus would have told us of such an important thing as moving from Saturday to Sunday, right? No. It's not there. Steve, it's not there. Nothing. Start with Matthew 1, 1 and go to Revelation 22 and you will find nil. It's not in your Bible. So wait a minute. We ought to be discerning people. When you read something like that, you read it closely and you go, all right, we're in the Bible. I need a footnote. I need a little letter that tells me this is where it's at. Or does somebody have the authority just to add to our faith by willy-nilly, whatever they want to add? Because this church is grounded in one single idea. Everything that we believe drives its origin from where? From the Bible. And if we can't show it to you from the Bible, then we stop administering it as authoritative. Insisting that it's right and must be followed. Again, Exodus 20, verse number 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day it is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you nor your son, daughter, male servant, female servant, livestock, sojourner within your gates for in six days. And then he grounds it in the creation mandate in chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 of Genesis. So I want to jump up and down loudly and boldly remind you that my covenant relationship with God is not through Moses and it's not through Abraham. Can somebody say amen? amen? It's through Christ. In Christ alone. And because it's through Christ, then that means that I am in the new covenant. Not a hybrid. And it's so important to realize. I'm in the new covenant. Ratified and inaugurated by Christ's death. In Exodus chapter 24, we read that Moses took the blood and threw it on the people. And said, behold, the blood of the covenant that Yahweh has made with you in accordance with all these words. Imagine how gross that must have been. He takes blood, and the children of Israel are everywhere, and he just starts throwing it on the people. Blood is flying through the air and spattering your face and your chin and your body. But that blood hitting you is your saying, I'm there, I'm in there. That's the equivalent of you signing on the dotted line. That's for me. I'm part of this. You stay there. He says, are we going to do this? And you say, yes, we are. 
And when you say, yes, we are, blood comes flying through there, and a bit of it lands on you, and that is your promise that you're going to keep this commandment. With that in the background, Jesus, in Matthew 24, Mark 14, Luke, he says that my blood is the new covenant. This is gigantic. Blood initiated the old covenant and his blood will be shed to inaugurate, to ratify the new covenant. He says this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant, not in a blood of an animal, but in my blood, my blood, the blood, my blood. That's incredibly important for you to see. Tonight, we are celebrating the new covenant. Not, not a modified new covenant, which includes some old covenant stuff, like keeping the Sabbath, but not circumcision or the Passover meal. Is it all, or is it just what we want? Grab a hold of this. Every celebration of the Lord's Supper, every single one of them, instead of the Passover, is a reminder that my relationship with God is through the new covenant, not the covenant God made with Israel in Exodus 19. Every single one of them. Let's compare and contrast the two covenants. In Exodus 19, verse 5, we read these words, Now therefore, if you will indeed, if you will obey my voice, and if you will keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession. At this moment, you should be thinking to yourself, and I just want to grab a hold of you and shake you for a moment right now. You should be thinking to yourself, praise God, my relationship with Christ is not conditioned on my obedience. Imagine that. Every single Israelite, I'll be his treasured possession if I do good today. Let me, let me, let me just grab you and just, just, just arrest you into a bit of awakeness. Do you realize today that you can have the worst day of your life? I'm talking about total failures in following Christ. I'm talking about today sucked royally in obeying Christ and you're still his treasured possession, not because of your own obedience, but because of what Christ did for you. Amen. The entire church should be coming off your seat in a praise of glory, hallelujah, that my obedience is not necessary to be part of his kingdom. There is no hybrid here. It's not a little Jesus and a little law. And the church has adopted modified legalistic standards. Compare this to Jer Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. And I'll have it on the screen for you. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, look, see, let me get your attention. The days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And it's not like the old covenant I made in Exodus chapter 19, the one that they broke. They broke, reading right here, they broke. Though I was their husband, declares Yahweh, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel at those days. I will put my law in there. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. No longer shall each teach his neighbor and each his brother says, Know Yahweh, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares Yahweh. I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. How many ifs did you read in there? How many ifs? How many ifs did you read in there? None. Now, do you want the if you or the I will covenant? I want the I will one. I want the one that Christ made happen. Please understand, church, that there is a giant, giant wall between these two covenants. The old and the new. The if you and the I will. 
It's gigantic. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I want you to read Paul's own words in his letter to the church at Corinth. Paul writes in verse number 20 of chapter number 9 of 1 Corinthians. So the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law. Though... Not myself being under the law. I'm not under the law. I can keep the kosher laws. I can go to the Sabbath worship. I can do all that to interact with a Jew that I'm trying to win to Christ. But I'm not under that law. I can put myself under it for a day, for a week, for a period of time in order to have a right relationship with this Jew in order that I might win them to Christ. But I'm not under that law. Keep reading. To those who are without a law. Now he's talking about Gentiles without that Jewish law. As without a law, though not being without the law of God. So nobody's outside the umbrella of the law of God. He says, but under the law of Christ. Probably the most neglected idea in all evangelical churches is the law of Christ. Probably the most neglected idea. Because what we normally have, what I grew up with in this church, is Christ and Ten Commandments. You think I'm wrong, Marcus? You agree? Yeah. And no one ever explained to me the transition from out from under the Ten Commandments and under the law of Christ. And it's huge. It's gigantic. It says to you in each and every situation, strive to love one another like Christ loves. Full stop, end. Yes, hallelujah. Amen, hallelujah. He says, though I not being under without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without the law. So Paul clearly communicates in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that he is not under the law. In chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, he says, For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law. You are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Please, I'm trying to be really clear this morning. I think that most people think that the difference between us and them, them being the Israelites under the law, was this. When I break the Ten Commandments, I'm forgiven. They weren't. Because grace forgives mine. We're both under the law, but they weren't forgiven, and I am through Christ Jesus. And that is a misunderstanding of all that Paul taught. You you need to recognize that for those Jews under that Mosaic law, this is the equivalent of how this would have worked. You on this side right here, Jerry, all of you are under the law. You're all under the law and condemned accordingly. When you come to Christ, when you come to Christ, Chris, I need you to participate. When you come to Christ, you move over here. You make a full transition to a whole. This is now the law of Christ. There's a transactional difference that occurs. All you folks are under the law when Christ recognizes, when Chris recognizes that Jesus is his Messiah, is his Savior, is the Lord, the Kurios. He moves from out of the umbrella of the law. And now, Chris, the law of Christ guides your entire life. Are y'all getting that? Sit wherever you want, brother, because I know that's uncomfortable for you to be there. We, We need to get this. We need to clearly understand it. Romans chapter number eight, verse two. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And then look at how Paul describes this law of sin and death. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse 7, he calls it the ministry of death. Carved on letters of stone. Do you realize that the fourth commandment is part of that? It was on that stone. And then he contrasts the ministry of death to the ministry of the Spirit. The ministry of the Spirit. Paul calls everything on the stone tablets the ministry of death. Do you see that? In fact, Paul contrasts the law with the Spirit. So in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul juxtapositions the law of Moses with the law of Christ. But in Romans and Galatians, Paul doesn't do that. Paul juxtapositions the law of Moses with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Wait a minute, Paul, which is it? Which is it, Paul? Is it the law of Christ or the law of the Holy Spirit? This is beautiful. This is amazing. So all you folks on this Jewish side are all under the 613 commandments. And Chris made that giant move over here. He came to Christ. He recognized Jesus as the Messiah, the Savior, the Lord. He came out from under the 613. He came under now one commandment, love others like Christ did. Boom. And God says, I'm not done with you, Chris. Not only am I going to write that law on your heart, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit living inside of you. What do I need that for? Let me explain it to you. Because sometimes you're wondering, wow, this is so awkward. He's so close to us. Yes. I'm trying to get your attention. Sometimes you're wondering, what, is it, what does love look like? In other words, is it grace or is it truth? Like you need three truths. One, two, three. Now stop sinning. Ever done that before? I got plenty of them. Okay. Come on. You remember this? That was me. Move your hand, son. It's coming. Am I the only one that ever played that game with dad? Or the, okay, you did it as well. There are two of us that are honest. All right, Richard, you, you got it. Yes. Right. Let's face it. Knowing what love is at all times is really hard. And there are not enough rules that could be written to explain each and every situation. Do you get that idea? How long would be the book that you would need? How long would the flow chart be that says, A, B, A, B, do this, do this? So then what do I do? Do you have the Holy Spirit living in you? Do you have the Holy Spirit living in you? Do you have the Holy Spirit living in you? Then seek the Holy Spirit. What do you mean seek the Holy Spirit? Lord, I know that I need to love this person in this situation, but I don't know what love looks like right now. I need you to show me what, what love looks like. This is real stuff. Some of you are in leadership positions on Fort Liberty. You have the authority to inflict judicial and non-judicial punishment on people. You can bust them down in rank. You can take money away from them. You can make their lives a living. And you really need to know what love looks like in each and every situation. Is this a situation in which I need to extend grace? Or is this a situation in which I need to extend tough love? Parents... Are you there with me? Parents, 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 are you, are you there with me? Adult parents? Because it doesn't stop. Sometimes it's worse. You know, I need wisdom. This is why Paul can tell you, Blake, follow the law of Christ and be led by the Holy Spirit. Because the very law of Christ, that the Spirit will guide you in understanding how to apply it. Please get this. I don't need language like this. I don't need you to tell me worldly employment. I don't need you to tell me recreations. Why not? Poo-poo on this. Why are you poo-pooing on that? Because of the Spirit. What do you mean because of the Spirit? The Spirit guides me. The Spirit leads me. 
When was the last time you sought the Holy Spirit concerning your faithfulness to the Lord's Day activities in church? Application. Let's make some. One man needs to mow his grass before the evening worship service. Another man is exhausted and what he needs more than anything else is a nap. Let each be led by the Holy Spirit. Let each be led by the Holy Spirit. And oh, by the way, let's make sure no, we're not judging each other. What does that look like? That bum needs to cut his grass. It's been 10 days since he's cut his grass. He's probably inside taking another nap. That's all he does is nap. We have no idea what's going on in his life. No idea. And then the other guy's out there slugging away on, on mowing his grass. Got a little 19-inch push mower, Walmart brand, you know, popping, stalls it out, starts it again. You know what I'm talking about. It's miserable work. And you're like, must not be much of a Christian because Christians don't mow their grass on Sundays. Hello? That spirit of judgmentalism is no room in the body of Christ. None. None whatsoever. I need to rebuke myself when I get judgmental like that. And maybe you do too. Paul says, if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. And what we love to do is we love to pull these special 10 out from underneath the 613 and put them in their own category and we call it the moral law. And that's how we remove them from the 613. And we call them the moral law. Galatians 5.18 says, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law except for the fourth commandment, right? Parentheses, except for the fourth commandment. No, that's not what it says. So the opposing argument goes something like this. The Ten Commandments is God's moral law applicable to all people everywhere forever, including the Fourth Commandment. But is that right? Is that right? The argument continues. We are not under the civil law, so no on the civil law and no on the ceremonial law. But the Ten Commandments, yes, and we change it to the moral law. And we make it in force for the New Covenant. And that's how we get around the idea of the fourth commandment being a Sabbath and we move it to Sunday and say we have to keep keeping it. But what I want to tell you this morning, church, is nothing in the Bible even remotely hints at the tripart division of, tripartite division of the Torah into these three categories. And I'm going to show you that in a minute from Colossians chapter 2. So remind me of that. Galatians 5.3, Paul says, I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is, he is obligated to keep the whole law. And this is important. Don't miss this. Paul was dealing with real life Judaizers who still felt that Christians needed to circumcise their boys on the eighth day. And this is what Paul's argument was. And it's very clear. Blake, if you choose to circumcise Kai on the eighth day because of the Mosaic law, put yourself under all of it. In other words, you don't get to pick and choose what you like. Like, I really like shellfish, so there's no way that I'm going to keep that one because I love seafood so much, but I really feel like circumcision is part of it. No, no, no. It's all or what, church? None. It's all or none from Paul's perspective. And what he says all is, is for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. What is that? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. There you have it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what you're supposed to do. All right, turn to Colossians 2. We've got two more texts, and we're going to nail this thing down to the wall. And that's why I told you it's not a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of a disc discrepancy in how we interpret Scripture. Turn to Colossians chapter number 2, please. Paul writes in verse number 16, therefore, I'll give you a chance to get there because I want you to see it in your own Bible. It might be a text that you need to underline. Therefore, therefore let no one pass judgment on you 
in questions of food and drink. All right, so let's make sure we understand what Paul's saying here. Within this body of Christ, there are some that are eating very organic, and there are some like myself that are eating less organic than others. <laughs> That's a kinder way of saying it. How many of you are the organic nuts? You know, you know, okay, bless your hearts. All right. <laughs> I'm thrilled that you'll get to live longer. All right. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Okay. The rest of us are trying to enjoy life right now. All right. Okay. <laughs> right. So when you see me with an extra helping of barbecue this afternoon in your plate, you're like, yeah, he really wants to die and get to heaven sooner. <laughs> yeah. But, but on a serious note, I have cut out Mountain Dews. Right. I haven't had a Mountain Dew in two years, Steve. Two years. Glory to God. I feel like I need one of those support groups like the, the, um, what, what the AA folks, you know, where they get together. Yeah. Two years since I've had a Mountain Dew. Two years. Wow. How'd you do it? Well, I'm just, you know. All right. <laughs> Strike that out of the record. Okay. <laughs> Questions of food and drink. So there are some Jews that are coming to Christ and they still want to keep the kosher laws. They still want, they grew up with the kosher laws and they want to keep the kosher laws. Should I, should I mock them for keeping those kosher laws? No, not at all. He says, do not pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. There are some of you in this church that feel like you can have four ounces of wine, six ounces of wine, and it does not impact your Christian walk others. There are some that have been so traumatized by alcohol like me. My mom died of kidney failure. It destroyed her life. I saw how alcohol impacted my entire family. I really have PTSD when it comes to alcohol. So I'm not having any of it. Should you judge me for my abstaining? Should I judge you for your freedom in the body of Christ to enjoy four, six, eight ounces of a, a glass of wine? No. We should not pass judgment on each other. Now, in the areas of drunkenness, that's totally different, right? Totally different. We need to have a conversation about your drunkenness. It's dangerous. It's impacting your life. It's hurting your children. We need to get a hold of that. All right? You getting that? Or with regard to festivals or new moons. Do you see that? Some of them were keeping the festival of booths. They were keeping this or that, unleavened bread. They were still keeping them. They were good kosher Jews and they were keeping the Passover. There were Gentiles in that same church who were like, I don't need, I don't know about no Passover. I'm not a Jew. I wasn't saved out of Exodus. What am I keeping that for? What are we supposed to do, Jews and Gentiles in the same church? What are we supposed to do? Love one another. Do we judge each other in these matters? Now, look what he just said right there. Or a what? Whoa, Paul. You made a mistake, Paul. Because the Sabbath is not part of the ceremonial law. Yes, I agree that ceremonial. And yes, I agree that and that ceremonial. But this is the moral law. Do you understand that if you were a Jew and you broke the Sabbath, according to the book of Exodus, you're supposed to be put to death. Put to death. Read it in your own Bible. So Paul must not know about the tripart division of civil ceremony and moral law. Because he just moved Sabbath into a category of what? Ceremonial. Do you see that or not? This is not what Paul did. The Bible doesn't say, let therefore no one pass judgment on you in the areas of honoring your father and mother, murder or adultery, stealing, bearing false witness, or coveting. Paul calls all of that morally right and wrong in the book of Romans and then says it's all fulfilled in one commandment, which is love one another. So he's not talking about those things. He's talking about these areas right here. So here's what I'm saying. Let me be clear this morning. Renee, this is what I'm saying. In a body of Christ, if some want to keep a Sabbath, they're free to keep a Sabbath. If others, Chris, don't want to keep a Sabbath, they're free not to keep a Sabbath. What I'm saying this morning is it should not be put in a confession of faith in which we all have to subscribe to it. Why should it not be put in a confession of faith? Because it's an area where we can have what? Freedom. Freedom. Look, you would vote me out if I said, you know, we're changing things around here. Adultery's fine. Right? Hey, don't judge that other couple that's committing adultery. Don't judge them. But the scripture doesn't support that. There are areas that these are non-negotiables. Murder is a non-negotiable. 
Stealing is a non-negotiable. Bearing false witness is non-negotiable. Why? Because it's in the Mosaic Law. No! No! Because there's no way you can say you're loving one another when I'm falsely bearing witness against you, brother. You're not loving your neighbor when you're sleeping with his wife. You're not loving your neighbor when you're stealing from them. Do you see the difference we're making here? These areas do not involve loving your neighbor. I can, I can keep the Sabbath on Saturdays and you don't even know about it. And it has no impact on you. I can keep the Sabbath on Sunday and you don't even know about it. But when I insist that you have to do it, I'm making it a moral requirement and scripture doesn't support that. You can only say, do not pass judgment on things that are not binding upon all Christians in all cultures at all times. One family wants to keep a Sabbath, another feels no obligation, let each be fully convinced in their own mind. Turn to Romans 14 and we'll be done. Turn to Romans chapter 14 and we'll be done. One last passage, one last time to turn to Scripture, and we'll wrap it up. I want you to see how Paul attacks this issue one more time, and then we'll be finished. Romans 14, very practical part of the book of Romans. The beginning is very theological, the end is very practical. Paul says, as for one who is weak in the faith, welcome him but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything while a weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who despises the one who abstains and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God welcomed both. Do y'all see that? Verse four. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now look at verse 5, and we're almost done. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Do you see that? Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. There is a freedom in this area. Why is there a freedom in this area? Let's make sure we understand this. Why is there a freedom in this area? Because Christ Jesus delivered us from the law of Moses and put us under the law of Christ. Amen. And in the law of Christ, the commandment is very simple and incredibly difficult. Very simple and incredibly difficult. Here's what you need to do for the rest of the week. Love everyone you encounter like Christ loves them. Just do that. Every situation, every encounter with every person, your neighbor, your coworkers, every single person, every soldier that works for you, every person in your business that works for you, everybody in your office, everyone that you encounter, everywhere that you go this week, Claude, just every single person, love them like Christ loves them. Easy or hard? hard. Very hard. Aren't you so glad that when you don't do it, you're forgiven? Aren't you so glad that you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you to guide you on what that looks like? Because it's not easy. We've turned love into means pass, pass, pass. Nobody ever gets a punishment. Nobody. That's not what love is. That's not what I'm suggesting. Literally, the most loving thing could be for a person that you're getting reduced in rank from a sergeant to a specialist. Because you've got to understand you can't do X, Y, and Z. You obviously haven't figured it out yet. And this is the most loving thing I can do at this stage in your life. All right, let's change it. 
How many would say, I know when my children are exhausted and I give them more grace? I know when my children are exhausted and I give them more grace. You know what you're doing? You're loving them differently. You're inconsistent. Am I wrong? I'm not, I'm not saying that's not a bad idea. I'm just showing you that you're modifying what love looks like in every situation based on what? Your knowledge. Your knowledge. You might even have a scenario where all your children are good at the same thing. Like one gets a punishment for something, the other one doesn't. Based on your knowledge that you're more mature, you know better in this situation, they don't. And you make a judgment call on what loving them looks like at that situation based on your wisdom from the Lord, your knowledge and experience. You have to carry that same idea everywhere you go with everyone that you interact with. And here's the very good news. When you fail miserably like we often do, be thankful you're under grace and not under the law. Because this is really hard. Father in heaven, thank you for your grace and thank you for your goodness. Help us, Lord, to understand how awesome it is not to be under the law, but to be set free in Christ Jesus. Amen.